What's up, comrades? Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. I cannot even tell you how excited I am about this episode we're bringing your way this week. It is a topic I've been wanting to cover almost since we started the show, coming up on two years ago now. We're going to be covering the failed German Revolution of 1918 to 1923, a series of events that I think its relevance, its importance for understanding not just the history of the 20th century left, but the legacy of what we're still dealing with today in terms of hauntology and lost futures is absolutely enormous and one that I have found I think it's very rarely covered, if ever, in most modern leftist discourse. To help us understand this history, we're going to be reading through Chris Harmon's 1997 book, The Lost Revolution, Germany 1918 to 1923. And to help me do this, we have a most excellent comrade slash patron joining us in the library and the history wing for the first time, Comrade Patrick. Comrade Patrick does an amazing job of condensing and summarizing Harmon's book. And we're going to talk about all sorts of things like the infamous voting for war credits by the SPD, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Leibniz, the Spartacus lead, the Spartacus uprising, the different fractures and splits, and the socialist and communist parties during the revolution as it unfolded over those five years. We'll talk about the cap putsch, the march action, and all sorts of other fascinating and little known events in revolutionary left history. We're gonna jump right into it today, but let's run down our typical ways you can support Red Library if you choose to do so or are not doing so already. Number one, if you'd like to support the show materially, Head over to patreon.com, that's www.patreon.com slash redlibrarypodcast. For as little as $1 per month, that is less than a quarter an episode, you get access to all of our exclusive patron benefits, such as access to the Discord server, movie nights, book groups, a whole lot of wholesome discourse, and high quality content. And as this episode is a great example of, very likely, the possibility you'll be asked to come on and do an episode with us sometime. We hit our goal of 100 patrons not too long ago, and the new goal is 250. So we're trying to build our listener base, build our little leftist podcast in Guerrilla Army, and I'd have to say, I think it's going quite well. So join in. Join in the fun. Remember to follow us on Twitter, like the show on Facebook. If you're listening on iTunes, please continue to go down and give us one of those star reviews. Maybe write us a line or two that helps put our show into the feed of other leftist podcast listeners across the globe. Remember that Red Library is part of the Lost Horizons Podcasting Network, a collection of shows focused on developing the dialectical pessimist perspective that includes us, our podrads over at The Regrettable Century, and From 78. Remember, we have a monthly roundtable discussion with a varying cast of characters from all the shows talking about all sorts of things related to politics, philosophy, psychoanalysis and all that other good stuff you can find a link for that in the show notes or just search on your favorite podcasting app well here we are still after all and last but not least just keep listening keep sharing keep enjoying because that is the capitalist injunction at the end of the day enjoy comrades whether you want to or not here we go me and comrade patrick on the german revolution we'll see you back here afterward What's up, y'all? Welcome to the history wing of the Red Library. Also, potentially the, like, hauntology wing of things that weirdly never get talked about or are covered in uh, left politics today. And uh, we're going to be talking the German Revolution, the Lost Revolution, as Chris Harmon calls it, from 1918 to 1923. And to help me do this, I have an excellent new comrade slash patron in the library. Introduce yourself to the world. Howdy, I'm uh, Comrade Patrick, broadcasting from somewhere in the Midwest, weird developmental wastelands. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that hit home. That, that hit oh, me yeah. right in the gut. Yeah, I know what that feels like. <laughs> oh, yeah, certainly, certainly. Just like a background on me, um, for whatever it's worth, kind of pretty new to like the Marxist side of, of leftism. I mm-hmm. uh, got into stuff after the 2016 election. I'm kind of in that age cohort of people who are into that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, drifted vaguely, was into Bernie, and then I found The Regrettable Century in November, December, and then read Library through there. And cool. Really got into the Yugoslavia episode and then kind of listened to the whole back catalog. So. Hell yeah. Yeah, still, yeah. I think some of the best work we've ever done for both of our shows is the Yugoslavia Definitely. stuff, for sure. So, well, you know, I think one of the things that 
I was most excited about whenever we were talking about doing this episode is I feel like you and I both have a very strong passion for history. And I think yeah. we had talked about Radio Warner a lot, and it seemed like you really dug Radio Warner. That's a huge influence on us. But I love doing episodes like this because it's it's that great place where I think our show really drew its inspiration from, where we're going to talk like theory, but also very historically grounded. And to yeah. me, that's kind of like, that's the sweet spot for the kind of work that I really love to do on the show. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm very excited about this. And that was, those are always some of my favorite episodes. So yeah, really excited to get into this. Yeah. Do you want to tell everyone about the particular book we decided to do and maybe why this book? Yeah. So this is The Lost Revolution, uh, Germany, 1918, 1923 by Chris Harmon. Harmon was a member of the Socialist Workers Party in Germany. I also know that he believed he had been involved in it when it was back as the International Socialist and maybe before that. And that was a Trotskyist grouping um, founded by Tony Cliff. Who mm-hmm. Fascinating background. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, this book came out in 97. Um, so it kind of is where we are. It's in that kind of very dark a period for Marxism after yeah. the collapse of the Soviet Union and kind of the neoliberal really absurd throughout the world. Yeah. So I think uh, Harmon, not to really like project onto him, but I think he might have been looking back thinking, all right, well, what happened? What can we really salvage from this? And, you know, kind of looking forward, what can we hold and know and whatever happens going forward? So I think that holds a lot of relevance for us because even though, you know, we've seen various resurgences of left thought here and there, you know, we're not anywhere close to where they were in this book about 100 yeah. years from where we're talking now. And I, I know we're going to talk lots of details here, but it is pretty astonishing to read about a strike where 450,000 you know, socialist yeah. and communist party members, it's like that is completely unfathomable to me. You know, when we just did that episode with Eric Chester on Eugene Debs and socialist and communist and anarchist sort of movements in, you know, around World War One. So I feel like it's interesting because we're like kind of focusing on this part of history, not only in the U.S., but also Western Europe, that maybe, again, is kind of this huge gaping void in our historical memory. And, you know, maybe we can talk about, like, why is that? Because I, I will tell you, I know we talked about this book because I guess two reasons. Like for me, one, I, whenever I wanted to really understand the history of this period and this revolution, there were only a handful of books I could find in English. And it was either this or that historical materialism book that's like 1,200 pages. And I was like, well, I'm going to start with this one first. But yeah. the other reason, and we were talking about this a bit before we recorded, I don't think I've ever heard another podcast, at least you know, a leftist podcast, that has covered this particular revolution and its impact and its historical legacy and the ripple effect it had on everything we think about in terms of the complete fucking catastrophic wreckage of the 20th century. I guess now after reading this, I don't know how you can really understand the rise of fascism in Western Europe. You can really understand the sort of long-term historical effects of the of the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Party. To me, it seems fundamental now that you have to understand this if you want to understand all those other things that we typically do talk about a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, you're absolutely right that this is just in every part of Western Europe, not something we talk about. I mean, you have the red years in Italy happening really around the same time um, that like the only place that I've heard them talk about were the run up episodes, the years of lead and yep. Radio Warner and Eva Lay was talking about that. Exactly. And that kind yeah. of nicely runs into like this stuff in a way. And uh, Harmony makes a claim. And we'll talk about this later. And it's true. Like at some point from like Turin to like the Ural Mountains, the only real power that existed were various forms of workers and soldier councils. Mm-hmm. And that's like, as you mentioned, hauntology, that's like this thing that like happened. It was a flash in the pan and it seemed like it disappeared forever. But yep. like very important and consequential thing that we seem to forget now. Yeah, I think the other thing too that really struck me about this is even reading Rosa Luxemburg and knowing a little bit of the history of the Fry Corps and Karl Leibniz and Rosa Luxemburg, not having this historical context of what was actually happening, of the divisions and tensions. And also, I think maybe something I came away from this with is kind of the strategic and political failures and missed opportunities that were so defining of what they were actually doing and responding to, you know, at the time. And I guess that's one of the things that I I know we're going to hit on. But at the end of the book, just like talking about what are those four different explanations for why did the German revolution fail? And I think it's going to lead us to a pretty, I I mean, something I think we say on Red Library sometimes, which is just basically not knowing when and how to seize a strategic moment or an opening, a historical opening. We have to like sort of relate the subjective and objective factors here of knowing when those openings happen, but how they can be missed opportunities and the 
effects of that or the yeah the results of that can be just completely cataclysmic in terms of actually challenging capitalism on a global scale. And I, I guess, yeah, if there was a time whenever that could have happened, the potential was there. It was during this five-year period. Yeah, and you really get the sense that even knowing when to take power and when to attempt to take power in those yep. historical moments, it's almost, I don't want to say it's unknowable because of the implications I would have for a revolutionary moment going forward, but <laughs> sure. it's damn near unknowable, at least in the moment. You have to have a lot of discipline and you got to have a lot of revolutionary swagger let's say yeah you gotta so, have a uh, big revolutionary energy at the moment <laughs> yeah 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 bre there bre <laughs> yeah so i was also thinking too you know in a way and maybe we can talk about this with Harmon kind of being you know more like cliffite like trotskyist in his orientation i i'm curious if we're going to come away from this with kind of being able to kind of pick up those little hints of like a very particular interpretation a very particular judgment based on being in the Trotskyist camp. So for example, like at the end of this, just basically saying, well, yeah, obviously like the answer to all this is like, you got to be super decisive, which is, you know, obviously, I mean, that's not a bad thing, but also like, well, yeah, it's just uh, like workers party, just uh, workers party is the answer for everything. And part of me is, you know, I'm curious about what didn't make it into the analysis um, because this is only one book of, you know, at least a handful. So I'm curious if we'll come away from having some critique of maybe certain interpretations, which are like solely focused just on it was really about decision that was made or not made or like yeah they just needed a workers party to exist in a certain way or that's what we need now just kind of to tap onto that a little bit right now i mean i think that that is like there's certainly something to that like it would have helped to have some sort of radical independent working class like pole of, of, of organization of power and the years running up to the collapse of the german empire but at the same time it's not so clear to me that, that would have been enough because germany is not russia it mm -hmm. was surrounded on every side by hostile powers and yeah. sort of core communist socialist revolution. So I think that, yeah, the Workers' Party, but we're kidding ourselves if we're not going to also, like, pay attention to the fact that, like, they might have been invaded from all sides, or, like, maybe France would have tried to take the Rhine and say that's ours, or Italy would have said, hey, Bavaria, that's our sphere of influence now, or, or something yeah. like that. Well, and I think we at least have some comparable thing to relate this to, which is literally the Bolshevik Revolution, where they got invaded by like 24 foreign powers, yeah, you know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You're not as big as Russia, and that, that's important. Yeah. <laughs> that actually matters. Well, and I think we'll come back to this too, right, about this uh, tension or conflict between uh, Luxembourg and Leibniz with Lenin about yeah. essentially, yeah, like Lenin already, I think Harman says at some point, he says like, well, the difference was Lenin already had a workers' party that they had built. So in some ways, it was was a different kind of strategic orientation or a different material condition in which you could talk about, okay, like, you know, what is to be done, right? The yeah. ultimate question for, you know, for people on the left always without exception. So I guess, do you want to talk more about why we picked this book? Because I'm looking over your notes here and I feel like we've touched on some of this, but there's a lot of other, I think, really great points of relevance. So I don't know. What do you want to hit here on just, yeah, why this book is maybe the one that we picked? Yeah, well, this book is really interesting because it kind of, you can see Trotsky is involved in this, like, but he's way off to the side. Stalin mm -hmm. has mentioned various times and you can kind of see uh, Harman's real Trotsky is uh, bona fides coming out when he's talking about mm -hmm. Stalin <laughs> in a kind of funny way sometimes. You know, see, see, Zinoviev plays a big role. The Hungarian, you know, Soviet Republic, Bela Kuhn is involved briefly and farcically. And so, like, <laughs> all these people we talk about did have a hand in this, and it reveals kind of another side, because I think the Russian Revolution, which, hey, it's uh, November 7th, that's uh, today. Um, oh, yeah. Is highly mythologized, and I think that kind of prevents us from necessarily, when we're analyzing it, having those daggers out and being able to, like, really pick apart and see what actually happened, that, like, this book, everything is so near-run and farcical where you're like, it's pretty hard not to come away and be like, at points, like, man, what the fuck is Zenobia thinking? Or like, exactly. Bella Kuhn, what in God's name were you even thinking? Like, So I really think this is a, a good way to help us critique the people who we revere in certain ways. And I, don't, I don't think we revere Bella Kuhn or Zenobia on this uh, whole of leftism. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. there are people who have done way more than I have, so there's something there. <laughs> <laughs> I got that going for him. No, I think that's like so brilliantly put because that is, I think, exactly why on Red Library we have such this emphasis on history. It's like we want to dispel these ideological, which, you know, again, I'm just to kind of be a little bit Althusserian about this. Even if you're a communist, you still like there's an ideology that you're using to yeah. relate to your material conditions and surroundings. And I think that's one of the things that we need our daggers to be most sharp for is to sort of cut away those ideological illusions and myths that I think really at the end of 
of the day, just obscure and make things more confusing and difficult to operate within the current conditions that we have. So yeah, I think that's exactly right. And you know, and, and in some ways, it's a, you know, a ruthless critique of all that's existing. No gods, no masters, you know, no one is above criticism, you know, especially these historical figures like someone like Zinoviev, who his impact on through the common turn and, and the effect of that um, you know, in yeah. some in some important ways, right? Like this completely unprecedented situation. We talked about this on the Yugoslavia episode. I mean, in some ways, there was like a element of like heroic, completely novel circumstances and who knew what to yeah. do specifically, you know, and also being able to say, yeah, there were horrible mistakes made that were catastrophic. And so we can hold both of those at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and we should if we want to be serious. And if we actually, I mean, I, I call myself like close to Marxist because I haven't actually read any Marxist texts, which I'm working on. Just got capital. Hell but yeah. I, if we're for people who are pretending to be in that area, <laughs> we should be critical of every, like the ruthless criticism of everything that exists. And that's, yeah, that's what I, I hope to. Aim. Well, maybe one other point I wanted to hit on real fast. Uh, before we kind of start diving in, just in terms of the, the impact or the, the effects of the failed German revolution, this is actually a quick uh, quote from Harmon on page three, and I just thought this kind of drives home some of what we're saying. He says, Isolation begat devastation, and devastation begat bureaucracy, bringing a new form of class rule. To tell that story would take us right away from the theme of this book. But the crucial point is that the starting point for the process of degeneration of the Russian Revolution lay outside Russia. Stalinism, as much as Nazism, was the product of the lost German Revolution. You know, again, there's definitely some Trotskyist interpretation there of what was happening in the Russian Revolution and what gave rise to Stalinism. But, you know, even if you don't take his Trotskyist kind of read of this exactly, the effects of the German Revolution, not only on the rise of, of fascism, and and really, I mean, the roots of fascism, like the Freikorps, and even some of the things that would eventually be utilized in the Holocaust, they started here against uh. workers and against strikers. And so to just understand that this revolution ended up being, yeah, hugely influential on the developments both in Russia and in Nazi Germany, I think is something, well, I don't really know how we're going to understand the 20th century without this as like a core pillar of that. Yeah, absolutely. Comrade, is there anything else you want to hit in this, uh, like, why this book stuff? There's a lot of good shit in here. There is. <laughs> That's kind of self-aggrandizing for me to say that. Whoops. Uh, this kind of <laughs> I am thing. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to touch on the compare, like, this, this whole series of events really fits into a series of European revolutionary events in the whole of the 19th century. Because this, even though it's like 20 years into the 20th century, this really is a world that is very 19th century. I mean, yep. this is right after World War One. So yeah, this John Dolan always talks about how insane the Victorian and like people after them were, and they were all those people for the most part have died, <laughs> but there's some of them still alive and they're just absolutely batshit insane at this point. But so much of this really feels like it touches on like the French Revolution of 1830, where you have this revolutionary fervor in the streets and then in the halls of power, you have people who are like, okay, how can we like direct this to not actually get the kind of radical Republic thing? Exactly. Um, it, touches like or you feel echoes of the uh, the bloody week in the paris commune uh during the spartacus uprising mm -hmm. um it really is like this whole patchwork of uh different european revolutions of the 19th century it's really interesting there's something else in here too that i think you just were spot on about this you were talking about you know for the parallels for anyone living in the u.s right now the rise of an ultra-nationalist right-wing movement and then the way that the, at least on the surface, what, what is supposed to be the socialist party that represents the working class, essentially is completely incapable and unwilling to do anything about it, and then is actively subverting the very radical revolutionary potential of the workers they're supposed to represent. So we're going to talk about Ebert and like the people in the party itself. And I think one of the things that I'm really glad we're going to finally be able to talk about on the show is the infamous, you know, voting for war credits, because that yeah. is one of those historical moments that is referenced but you know very rarely do you ever get a sense of what was actually going on so again we're going to yeah. be able to unpack a lot of this stuff i think yeah i agree absolutely you want to get into it i guess yeah i guess no time like the present kind of so start let's... with the introduction yeah i guess what do you want to hit on i know i just read that quote from the introduction was there anything else in here that you wanted to really kind of hit on in terms of what Harmon is just sort of uh, how he's setting up the history itself. Just like any kind of revolutionary period is always like the ruptural moment that's incredibly fraught in a society. And yeah. uh, I need to finish it, but I read like half of Endo Traverso's book, uh, Fire and Blood, mm. which is a really interesting book about the period that we're talking about 
um, he starts in 1914 and it's in 1945 and kind of says it's, it's all one big conflict. Yeah. It's like a European pan European civil war mm-hmm. and that all these revolutions are also cross cut with wars of national liberation, civil wars, <laughs> conventional imperialistic wars. It, it creates phenomena that are incredibly difficult to understand with like a pretty simplistic analysis. And that's kind of what the, introduction gave me it was this crazy series of political convulsions that in it had this kernel of this kind of utopian possibility and i think that's exactly right you know that again we're kind of always looking for those lost futures those those kind of moments that were present that could have existed those potentialities that failed or were betrayed i think this to me is maybe one of the ultimate examples of that in the 20th century at least and um i was just going to tag a really quick quote on here this is on page three uh just from mm-hmm. zaddy lenin about the relevance or the relationship between the Bolshevik and the German Revolution. He says, without the revolution in Germany, we are doomed, Lenin declared in January 1918. But that's an idea that's really interesting to me because it's not something that I encountered before really encountering um, the regrettable century because I didn't yep. know jack shit about the Russian Revolution mm-hmm. like eight months ago. I mean, it's really true that uh, the fate of the Russian Revolution, at least for a period of time, because I don't agree with Harmon's overall kind of analysis that like, I don't think the German Revolution was the last best chance for the Soviet Union actually to represent this emancipatory horizon but it probably does in this period like it probably locked everybody into what happens in, i mean it's bad to think about history like that probably but it probably does make world war ii a lot harder to avoid yeah when you have the failure of this movement and uh, one more thing i i wrote here that harman note mentioned in the introduction is its relation to uh 1968 in the upsurge of revolutionary events throughout the world then um because this really does remind you of France 1968 in a certain way where you have Mm. like this nominally revolutionary party which is so part of the state and so has such stakes in the maintenance of the status quo that when the time comes they are like oh how can we not do this because that would be pretty bad for us bureaucrats inside the party apparatus right i mean in some ways you know it's it's a ever pressing and persistent problem that we have to grapple with for anyone who talks seriously about left politics i think is yeah, what happens whenever the people who are supposed to represent the working classes are actually gaining political power? I mean, at one point, the SPD, like, occupied, like, 50% of the parliament in Germany, right? And so we have to understand, like, okay, like, this is a serious, persistent problem of what happens whenever those people actually gather their own material interest in perpetuating, like, the bureaucracy and the status quo that they're a part of. It's a question, we saw this in Yugoslavia. It's obviously, I mean, coming from any tradition that's like Trotskyist or, like, thinking about the relationship between Stalin and the bureaucracy. These are questions that I still don't think we have good answers to. And so, hopefully, knowing history like this, it'll at least give us some some ideas of what not to do or, or potential pitfalls. I agree. And uh, there's a Cosmonaut episode with August Nymphs. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but it's about parliamentarism. They talk about how hard it is to engage in parliamentarianism and also like an aspect of it was like holding, you know, the representatives accountable. And, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're interested in this, I'd say listen to that episode. That is a lot. Of- yeah. Big but, shout out yeah. to our Cosmonaut comrades. We'll post the link for that episode in the show notes for people to check it out. You want to start diving into chapter one here? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. All right, comrade, so, you're, you're in the driver's seat, so go for it. Well, all right. I'm driving. Everybody should be scared. Yeah. So we're all uh, going to die. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Chapter one starts talking about the journey. German Empire, and this isn't Germany as we know it now. Germany as we know it now is awfully small compared to Germany in, in 1920, Germany 100 years, or not even 1920, Germany 115 years ago. Mm-hmm. Awfully small. It inhabited, you know, had areas in Poland, out in uh, Silesia and Posen and uh, in West Prussia. Sorry to anybody who's listening to this and I'm like messing up pronunciation because that's just a thing that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> they also controlled East Prussia, which was an area near the Baltics, actually. So the German Empire was a massive, massive uh, piece of land in Europe. And it uh, was formed in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War, after Bismarck and his cadre defeated Napoleon III in the uh, really one of the dumbest wars I have ever encountered (laughs) in human history. Yep. Just a quick aside, a lot of officers in the French army couldn't read. Um, that was so Germany is formed kind of as a union of the Prussian state with all these smaller German principalities. And you can kind of see that survive in the structure of the German Empire. It's yep. the Prussian or the Kingdom of Prussia, you have free cities, kingdoms, duchies, counties, all sorts of things. And by the time we get to just to fast forward a bit, by the time we get to 1914, the main power centers in the German Empire are the kind of bourgeois power centered around the Prussian state. 
and the working class, nominally working class power, centered around the SP Day, as I understand it. The SP Day was, as I'm imagining most of these listeners know, was a social democratic party. It's Official name in English would be the Social Democratic Party of Germany. It was founded in, actually, I don't know exactly when it was founded, sometime in the late 19th century as a kind of union between, Harman puts it as the union between this Marxian revolutionary socialist current and this Lasallian reformist revolutionary current. And by 1891, they start to coalesce around the Erdfurt program, I believe. Mm -hmm. And in this period, the 1890s, they start to build party working class institutions that are kind of independent from the state, been called a state within a state. So they have schools, they have working class clubs that working class people can go to, all sorts of cultural institutions, all sorts of support institutions to kind of gain popularity, gain support of the working class, which is immensely successful. Eventually the SPD came to have a membership of like 4.5 million members, which as a percentage of the German population, mm-hmm. that's so mind-bogglingly insane as an American right now. I, I can't even imagine how many Americans that would be relative to our population to have in a working class socialist organization. Yeah, I was um, wondering about that. Like, yeah, what would the comparable way to understand that be? I mean, again, if you think about the SPD, like having 50% of parliament at some point, I mean, we can't even conceive of that. Even if we think about like Eugene Debs and the height of like a socialist movement in the US, I, it still pales in comparison. You know, what? what, like Debs had like a million votes was like the most. Yeah. You know, and so again, just relative, I think, yeah, we ha- it's just a staggering thing to consider. Yeah, I know DSA is like at 80,000 members right now. I saw a tweet. I'm not, I didn't look up the math, but I have no reason to believe it's not true. I saw a tweet that said the membership of the SPA in like 1912, if you were to extrapolate or adjust that to American population now, it would be 400 thousand people <laughs> so that's like <laughs> oh an idea God. of how many people yeah if, like we were to have organizations relative which is like you were talking about how crazy it is to see 450,000 people come out in berlin to strike and i'm like yeah some of the biggest protests in my town here are like 4,000. yeah uh, <laughs> just, it's a different era of politics and that you know yeah. doesn't mean we're doomed now it's just a different time i mean there's less stuff to do on a very fundamental level so of course you do that but getting back to what i was talking about mm-hmm. eventually the SPD came to have uh, 4.5 million members 90 daily newspapers and was arguably the biggest working class organization in the world yeah which is insane yeah it's wild to um, think about. yeah but what happens when you have like huge hegemonic organizations like this which is probably a issue for revolutionary parties when i think about it is like once you have something that is like a singular pole of power, you start to just get lots of people who are opposed to the opposite poles of power joining it because like that's the only thing that you have. Mm-hmm. So you have a party that has like people like Bernstein and people like Rosa Luxemburg. And you have people way to the right of Bernstein too. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure that he joined the the independent social Democrats when the split came after the war, which gives you an idea of the bread, I guess, of political ideology in the SPD at that time. They have lots of influence, but it's got lots of, salient divisions at this point and i mean that's all i have for chapter one really i don't know if you have anything else to say yeah i was just going to touch on a couple of quick quotes but yeah i think that was actually a really great encapsulation of kind of the background and yeah the complexities of the spd uh this is page five and one of the things i'm always really interested in is the the sort of nature of the state in any particular revolutionary moment and the power of the state and how it's structured so Harmon says the german state was not a conventional bourgeois democracy in germany unlike france the middle class had not fought an all-out battle to bring power into its own hands and after its miserable failure in 1848 it had meekly subordinated itself to the Prussian monarchy. The result was a compromise in which the old monarchic structure continued, but adapted itself increasingly to serve the ends of big business. And I just thought that was a really important thing to consider. Again, it's just the particular history of, of Prussia after 1848 and how you see, yeah, kind of like you were saying, this like weird hybrid where there's still a monarchical structure, but very much allying itself to bourgeois capitalist interests. And then that also created a state that was, it was strong enough that it disincentivized like open challenges to it. And I think uh, Harmon even makes some comments about how the SP Day. Yeah, so this is on page six. He says there was freedom of speech, but only within tight limits. The Social Democrats, despite being the largest political party, have been formally banned until the early 1890s. And the law was used with great frequency against the socialist press on one pretext or another in what one study has called a quote, a policy of persistent guerrilla war against the party by the authorities, unquote. Kind of noticing that, yeah, like this party is huge, but against this really powerful state still has some limitations in what it can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
But yeah, I think that was really, those were the highlights for me for chapter one. So I guess uh, history marches forward. Yeah, so, you know, getting on, getting on to chapter two. We start to talk about the outbreak of World War One. Everybody knows World War One. our good old friend, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, had the random, random fucking unfortunate luck of being assassinated by Gravio Princep, who was just trying to eat a sandwich after he failed to kill himself <laughs> with a bad cyanide capsule. So that kind of spirals out of control. Uh, Austria says, what the fuck, tries to get Serbia basically to renounce any real independence. Russia backs Serbia. France backs uh, Russia. Germany backs Austria. Everything goes to shit. Germany invades Belgium. And then Britain gets involved. I didn't need to say any of that, but it's just fun. That was the best summary of the lead up to the outbreak of World War One I've ever heard in my life. You just gave us a classic moment of it. Oh, <laughs> it was yeah. amazing. Okay, anyway, brilliant work. Brilliant work. Keep going. There we go. So, the Espe Day, they initially were opposed to the war, mm -hmm. had a very uh, good and correct line, and there's a quote right at the end of chapter two. I think we have, I have a Kindle version. Um, so, for me, it's page 23. I'm not sure what page it'll be for you. Okay. But uh, the beginning of the first part of chapter two, here are some quotes. There's two different quotes. The first quote, the class-conscious German proletariat raises a flaming protest against the machinations of the warmongers. Not a, a drop of any German soldier's blood must be sacrificed to the power hungry, sorry, to the power hunger of the Austrian ruling clique to the imperialist profiteer. And that's contrasted with another quote, which you hear 10 days later. It starts out. For our people and its peaceful development, much, if not everything, is at stake in the event of the victory of Russian despotism. Our task is to ward off this danger, to safeguard the civilization and independence of our own country. We do not leave the foggy land in the lurch in the hour of danger. Those quotes were 10 days apart. So yep. that tells you that even though the Social Democratic Party initially had a very kind of brave, kind of heroic, correct, I would argue, mm -hmm. as much as you can argue, line about World War One, they quickly realized that much of German society was, for some reason, really hungry for war. Everybody in this period was absolutely insane, including the German high command who assumed that the war would take nine months, yep. which gives you an idea of, of why people were really interested in this war. They thought it would be like 1871, where you just kind of roll into France, beat up on some illiterate officers, go into Versailles, sign a treaty. Hey, you have some fun, it's over. But that didn't happen. So the SPD, uh, I think the rationale for supporting the war was because so much of the working class as they understood part of the war, which I haven't ever really looked into that, but you have to wonder how much that was true because mm -hmm. at this point, how much the upper echelons of the Social Democratic Party were actually in touch with the working class. But I think, yeah. I mean, from what I saw reading the book, the vibe I got was that the other bourgeois Democratic parties were scoring the war and the Social Democrats wanted to, maybe having the experience of being banned up until 1890, didn't really want to give the government reason to ban them so that they supported the war. I don't know, maybe that's a reason, maybe it's not. but. I mean, if you think about the situation in the U.S. too, with what we just did with Eric Chester on that episode, I mean, opposing war and like anything that can be interpreted as being subversive to the war effort, it's like even more justification to even clamp down harder on radical and revolutionary groups. And even people who were like fairly liberal and centrist, you know, like the, the early forms of the ACLU, I mean, they weren't actually opposing the war, but they were interpreted as such. And so, I mean, in some ways, if that is the case, I mean, can't really argue with the rationale, at least, of like why they would decide to support it, especially coming from that history of being banned and, and wanting to be less marginalized. And then, yeah, and I think you're right, too, in the upper echelons of the party, Abert and like even Hugo Hassa and everyone else, I mean, who, you know, was the joint party president, yeah, I mean, like, how much were they really connected to what the working classes were actually interested in? Probably yeah, not I much, mean, is my guess, yeah. Yeah, probably not. The people who did oppose the war were put in jail, were, like, Rosa Luxemburg was in prison, I'm pretty sure. Called Liebnik was drafted at the age of 40 mm -hmm. and then arrested. You know, Kurt Eisner, I know, spent time in jail. A lot of the people who vocally did oppose the war did face state repression, and so, yeah. you know, you would want that's payday to oppose the war but you, i you also would kind of assume that it would like at least the open legal aspects be like smashed by the state in that yeah event. so it's a complicated situation there's no correct answer mm -hmm. uh, and history unfolds in ways that kind of make the question irrelevant anyway yeah uh, <laughs> that's true yeah yeah i had a note um right when it says 10 days separated those two statements my note was like jesus fucking christ <laughs> yeah i know that's wild like the shift there but yeah the war advanced it took a lot longer than people thought which eventually caused a lot of stresses on, on german society and the german economy kind of i guess getting into a more of the historical course of things carl liebnicht 
was the first SPD deputy to publicly oppose the war. He voted against war credits. I, I think that was in either 1914 or early 1915. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I know that's a big thing in the general history of socialism in the early part of the 20th century is which parties of the Second International did and didn't like support the war. And, yep. I mean, pretty much everybody did except for the, obviously the Bolsheviks and I, I know Somebody else, somewhere else didn't, but I don't know who. But they're a rarity for sure. I mean, that's that yes. was one of the things that wasn't predicted or anticipated was, yeah, the sort of like national chauvinist kinds of strains and how dominant those would become. You know, there was one thing in here too, just in terms of political economy and the state I found really interesting. So I can't remember how much Harmon goes into this, but talking about... You know, for a very long time, the development of at least industrial centers, not all over Germany, but in certain pockets, did create a sort of rise in like standard of living and it garnered a lot of support from the working classes. But with the, you know, the war dragging on and the complete horrible destruction of it, that the war was actually undermining like the conditions that allowed the working class movement to adapt to the Prussian state for so long. And so I found that to be a really interesting structural sort of contradiction that's going to be really hugely influential here. It's just that, yeah, like the engaging in the war and it not going the way that it was thought is create that that sort of feeling of the very thing that was actually causing the working classes to support the state and the structural conditions in the international situation just yet starting to create an opening where that's going to start to siphon that off in a different way. Yeah. And and to emphasize that. You know, as as much as it is not breaking lo- the ultimate logic of the capitalist system, mm-hmm. the uh, working and living standards that the German working class had at the beginning of the war in 1914, throughout the course of this book, I'm pretty sure they never got back to that. Like, it's yeah. always a reference point. It's always like, oh, we're, our wages are 30% of pre-war conditions, or yeah. we're back to 80%. But, like, they never really got back to that, which shows you how good that era was for... <laughs> it wasn't great, but, like, if... It's better than every man or like pretty much every man in your family dies and then you don't have a job and then inflation is so much that it's like two million dollars to buy a potato, two million marks or whatever to buy a potato. Like, yeah, I don't know. So there's a not to digress, but there's a hardcore history. But dang, Harlan, I was really into that as a kid, which explains how weird I am as a person now. (laughs) But uh, he talks about the fall of the Roman Empire and he's got you talking about like how much shit these people lived through and how like it's really you put you in a different position when you actually obviously you want to encounter and view history through a structural view understand history not through like individuals but through the collective yeah things that happen when you have tons of individuals but also it really changes how you experience and understand history when you, you learn about like the actual like he talks about the caloric intake of miners at some point yep. it's like literally people didn't have enough to eat to actually live it's i mean yeah. that's like we know that but it's when you put it in those terms it just i always get blown away by uh by human suffering <laughs> and there's a lot of that in this yeah, I mean, I will say there was a book I read recently that was a political theoretical approach to how to understand poverty by Charles Tilley. And one of the main ways that he talks about it is looking at caloric intake of specific individuals in specific situations. And yeah, I think you're right. That particular way of thinking about it, like drives home to me what exactly we're talking about with human suffering in a way that I just you just don't really see in other ways, or it's really easy to like sort of abstract too far from the actual like material effects on the body and that you know kind of tells us why things go the way they did which is you start to see more more members of the spda and more i think people in german society speaking out against the war eventually to the point in 1917 lost my place in notes but i know in 1917 you have the formation of the the uspd or the uh, upd the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany. Mm-hmm. I know it in, so the left wing of the SPD, effectively what happened is uh, there were a group of SPD members who were expelled from the party in 1917. I don't know if they were part of a specific anti-war action, but they were generally like known as anti-war activists. And that, mm-hmm. you know, as I put earlier, included Kautsky and Bernstein. I don't know much about either, but I do know that they're always pointed to as, as like these arch reformist characters Bernstein more than Kautsky obviously yeah mm-hmm. who's a very complicated character or we'll yeah just to boil down to that but that kind of shows you how right-wing the SPD was at this point relative to other parts of German society and you start to see formations of proto-communist formations um, not ideologically but they were the Spartacus League was kind of a proto-party formation yeah um, that was led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were probably the two most well-known members and you also have the SPD so those are kind of the three Parts of the working class power that exists, and as the war goes on, German state uh, weakens and weakens. 
She has weird effects at home. There's less and less food. There's more and more strikes. You mentioned there is a strike. I don't know where it is in the book, but talks about like 400,000 workers in Berlin come out during mm-hmm. the war. And eventually, he also goes into something we should talk about, which is the relation in the army between officers and uh, enlisted men, which is oh, something yeah. that has always been in armies throughout all of human history. The enlisted men lived in hell, especially on the Western Front. Mm-hmm. Like these trenches, the German trenches were nicer than the Allied trenches, but they weren't good. You know, everything's wet. There's rats everywhere. There's maggots in your food. You know, there's so much. Art, there's an art, like a level of artillery shelling that we don't even know what it actually sounds like. Because before modern recording, we haven't really seen anything since. Like mm-hmm. it's some of the most hellish, mind-boggling conditions ever. And the enlisted men live in that, and they're in that phase. And every day, you know, being told to go over, attack machine gun nets with barbed wire everywhere and just die. And the officers don't do jet K shit. <laughs> he says they sit around, polish their fingernails. They have special clubs. They have way more privileges, way more rights than the enlisted men. And, and they don't, you know, they get better food. They aren't starved. Yeah. And that's important because uh, you eventually see, as the war progresses, armies everywhere. Uh, you see this in France, you see this in Britain. They're less and less able to put up with shit. Uh, mutinies become more and more common. And uh, that kind of plays directly into the end of the war. As the Americans get involved, eventually the Germans just can't put up with it. They don't have massive, you see this all the time, they don't have massive colonial holdings to bring in troops from. They don't have another place to grow lots of food because they needed so many men at the front that they didn't have anybody really to grow food. One in 10 of every men, I think, in Berlin was drafted and sent to the front. Like there were massive manpower shortages, which in turn helps fuel all the like labor strife. Yeah, and I think one thing too, I wanted to touch on just about the, that sort of heightening contradiction that's happening in the in the background here. So this is uh, this is on my page 19. Harmon says, The war destroyed many of the links which had bound organized workers together, but at the same time it concentrated the working class into even larger units of production and created a new uniformity of conditions within the class. If the immediate effect was to make organization against the war all but impossible, the long-term effect was to create a new basis for revolutionary organization, both among the sectors traditionally influenced by social democracy and among newer sectors immune to its influence, which might help us explain the rise of like these proto-communist formations like the Spartacus League and things like that. But to me, I thought that was a really good description of that, again, that like heightening sort of unintended contradiction and its effects that's happening here. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, and, and I, I really encourage everybody to read this book. Harmon specifically, I think, tries to put it in language that is like really simple and really, really easy to understand. It was testament that the, when I started reading this, I was drunk as hell. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> I was just flipping through it. I had to go but, back. I didn't remember any of it. But I will say, I think I'm glad you touched on that, too, because that was one of the things I was really impressed by with this book is at first you're like, wow, this is like very readable. And it, mm-hmm. it's not very hyper complex and dry history. But I mean, coming away from it, it I, I found it to be exceptionally well written. And uh, yeah, did a great job of balancing density with actually still being really readable and i think kind of a page turner i you know i was looking through this it's been a while since i took this many notes in a book and was like bracketing and underlining. i think that's a testament to Harmon's writing i think he did a great job one reason to get the book is just to see all the footnotes at the end yeah that that's super valuable because that's all the sources he has yep a lot of them are in french and german but i mean it's not that hard to parse through that kind of stuff with some level of understanding if you kind of are familiar with romantic languages. But uh, German's not a romantic language, don't think I'm an idiot. But, um, <laughs> so we see the formation of the USP, UPD, lots of weird different uh, English trans- translations of that acronym. And then you see the Spartacus League, which we talked about, and then you see the good old form as SPD. And mm-hmm. those are kind of the three working class powers in his day myself. But as everything falls apart, you get to a point in November 1918, where you have the November Revolution, which is the year after the October Revolution, which is fun. Um, and that is a pretty chaotic series of events where the Germans are no longer able to really fight the war. The whole political apparatus at this point, uh, so the Reichstag existed and now has had nominal authority, sometimes more, sometimes less. Mm-hmm. So by the time you get into 1916, 1917, 1918, Ludendorff, our good old mm-hmm. guy Ludendorff and Hindenburg, they've effectively established what a lot of historians call a military dictatorship, which, you know, pretty much is. You don't really have any sense of, like, freedom of speech that you did even, even the limited sense of freedom of speech that you had in the 
the earlier German Empire is gone. Eventually, they just collapse. You know, the German army can't fight anymore. They come to the negotiating table, and any sense of confidence in the monarchy is just destroyed. I mean, it's hard to describe, kind of. This war just changed the way that people looked at the world and were related to their governments, I guess, in a, in a way. And so that just shattered any confidence in the monarchy. So the Kaiser abdicated, which caused a fairly chaotic situation in Berlin, where you have, I think is Ebert, or was it Noska, declared, or it was somewhere else, declared the German Republic to a cheering crowd outside of a balcony in the Reichstag, I want to say. And then in another part of Berlin at the same time, you have Karl Liebknecht declaring the Workers' Republic of Germany. Actual state power kind of stops in Germany. And you start to see in Kiel, sorry to go back. but No, 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 German, I think it's good, yeah. The, sorry, the German Naval High Command had this idea since they knew the war was over. And they ended World War One in a really psychotic way where they scheduled the end of it and kind of set the date. And then they went up to that. And uh, so the German Naval Command decided that they were going to do this apocalyptic battle with the Royal Navy who was blockading German ports in the North Sea. Mm -hmm. And in Kiel, the sailors were like, well, of course we're not going to do that. The war was already lost, so they refused and they were arrested. So you'd seen this before, but this time the state wasn't able to stop it. You saw thousands of sailors marching through the streets of Kiel. They were armed because they're sailors and eventually start skirmishing with the police and any kind of state forces, but they don't get defeated. They gain popularity and they eventually declare a soldiers and workers council or mm -hmm. sailors and workers council in that yeah. state. And this kind of sets the template. You start to see this ripple out through across Germany. That's how it happens. And so that's a context in which you see Ebert and uh, his clique and uh, Liebnik and the, which lots of people were pissed off at both of them for doing that because they're like, well, that's, we, we haven't really gotten to that point. That's why you see the kind of joint declarations of republics at that point. But even in that context, neither of them were real. Like you, just because they said there was a German Republic, the only power really were the workers' councils. And even outside of any socialist republic, the only power were the workers' councils. And even the workers' councils weren't in any way ideologically unified, uh, which gets into some later chapters, stuff going on, but yeah. Yeah, I think Harmon has this really sort of great example, too, of where Ebert, you kind of see his politics and how he's going to basically try to restrain the revolutionary potential of what was actually happening. So he says, yet the authorities still seem to hold the capital. The soldiers remained in their barracks, dutifully saluting their officers. The workers fought on and off at the factories as if nothing was changing. Only a narrow stratum of their leaders were involved in the frenetic activity. The Social Democrats have been doing their best to head off the revolution by pressing for the Kaiser to abdicate voluntarily voluntarily in favor of some other member of the royal house. As the leader Ebert told the prime minister, Prince Max, and this is Ebert, he says, unless the Kaiser abdicates, a revolution is inevitable, but I will have none of it. I hate it like sin, unquote. Which to me, uh, that happening very early is going to, again, I think, set the tone for Ebert's sort of actual, yeah, relationship to the workers' councils and, yeah, that sort of, uh, that attempt to constrain and I think very effectively, yeah, like kind of fuck up a lot of what could have been the SPD's like role in actually being a much more mm -hmm. revolutionary force. That uh, is a lazy and a sloppy comparison, but in just world, the SPD would have been closer to the SRs. Maybe everything, if it would have gone wrong, it would have gone wrong in a different way at least. But at least, you know, maybe we could uh, have a little bit more dignity and now it went wrong. So. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So you were talking about Ebert, and uh, there is a, at some point, there is a meeting in, I want to say Berlin, of like a National Congress of Soldiers, Workers, Councils that more or less confirms uh, Ebert is the president of like this thing. Everybody's sort of starting to agree it's the German Republic. At the same time, though, he and the rest of the upper echelon of the SPD, previously after trying to stop any revolution, were kind of contacting any sort of military high command and saying, okay, well, what can we do? At this point, the military maintained pretty good order as I remember retreating from after the peace is declared on November 11th. They maintain fairly good order as long as they're outside the borders of Germany. As soon as they get back to Germany, unit cohesion just sort of melts away. Mm -hmm. So you have this very chaotic turn of troops back to where they came from. And in a certain way, the kind of the German army as it was, like the Imperial German army, just sort of stops to exist. And that's important because it gets into this grouping or the, this military force called the Frey Corps, the Frey Corps, mm -hmm. the Frey Corps. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to say the Frey Corps. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. So it's German for free regiment. And it's actually, there were Frey Corps throughout the history of Germany, dating back to the Thirty Years' War. So it doesn't actually mean anything in particular. It just kind of means like a mercenary-ish 
troops. Since the official military had more or less melted away, uh, when you get into all these revolutionary struggles that we see in 1918 and 1919, the government didn't have any troops to really repress them. Some of them the troops with revolutionaries. And aside from that, there wasn't much of an organized military outside of the offer class to call on. So they start to organize nationalist right-wing sympathetic troops into the Fry Corps, which eventually act as their organized military wing. You know, I, I kind of think of it as like a paramilitary, a little bit more than a militia, a little bit less than like a full, full army, but they're battling often, you know, pretty disorganized armed workers. So having even nominally organized troops with a couple armored cars and some artillery pieces puts you at a pretty big advantage there. Yeah, that kind of all starts to deliver us to uh, the Spartacus uprising, which is in 1919. Um, that's sort of... Yeah. Um, do you have anything relating to this kind of chunk of the book? Yeah, actually, just two things I wanted to hit on really fast. I do want to make sure that we talk about uh, Nazca. And, yes. Uh, because I do think he's a really key figure here. So Nazca was one of the right-wing social democrats. And Harmon, and this is on my page 40, but he basically talks about... So Nazca basically was... He had orders to offer the sailors so in, that we were talking about in Kiel an amnesty if they returned to their ships and handed over their arms. But basically, he kind of occupies this very, very strange role where he emerges, because he's this right-wing social democrat, as a representative that's like charged with putting down the revolution in Kiel. But he's also seen as the representative of the sailors and the workers expected to carry the revolution forward. So I think, again, it's that kind of contradiction that's really coming to the forefront here in the relation of the SPD to the workers and, and sort of their role in the government. But just to go, uh, one thing on, on the Fry Corps, too, that I thought was important is Harmon talks about that in terms of sort of the ideological basis of the Fry Corps for a lot of them, he says most of the leaders were monarchist in spirit. And so even after the Kaiser abdicates and the idea is, is that, you know, we no longer have this monarchist kind of regime, the Fry Corps end up kind of represent a return of the old order in this very violent, brutal way. And so I think that's also going to be important in how all of this is going to play out is, again, sort of the, the Fry Corps being these representatives of a sort of like reactionary response to, to the revolutionary conditions as they develop. Yeah, and actually the idea of like monarchists working in concert with a nominal republic is something you see in France actually right after 1871 in mm. the whole... Paris Commune after that, a lot of the Third Republic were actually like monarchists, but for some reason, France stayed a republic, mm. um, even though, yeah, it's just kind of weird, vague historical parallels. But, but yeah, no, I'm glad you touched on Nuska too. He is a contemptible figure who also <laughs> suffered a lot afterwards. So it's yeah. just like, you don't even know what to do with it. He is right wing social democrat, ended up in the book, he kind of ends up as a metonymy at some point for the uh, for the Fry Corps. Mm -hmm. And then later on, which actually happens to a lot of these social democrats, he ends up in a concentration camp because he was more the SPD. So these people end up really tragically suffering from this order which they help preserve, which yep. is, you want to scream when you're reading the book because like that that's a huge aspect of it because it's like they don't even benefit from this <laughs> helping this old order regain control for for what i think that is such a great point to bring up is you have to yeah really ask like what was all of this for and and they end up being destroyed by the very thing that they were they were trying to serve its interests which very important political point that we can probably take some relevance for today yeah very eerie especially today <laughs> yeah. but yeah that sets us up i think fairly well to get into the spartacus uprising which is Always for me been like something people talk about. Well, not really even something people talk about, but something that gets like vaguely referenced, like Rosa Luxemburg. Yep. We know that, oh yeah, she was a woman. Like that seems to be a part of it. But it's one of the the most forceful and uh, really leaders of the communist movement and ultimately mm -hmm. communist party, which is formed in, as far as I can tell, it's formed in December, on December 31st, 1918. There mm -hmm. She was one of the most important leaders in theorists of that group she dies in the spartacus uprising and that kind yep. of is what i typically hear about it it happens Liebnik and luxembourg die and as far as i know a lot of the time that's the end of the german revolution and a lot of stuff that i encounter same that's why i was a, like a little shocked reading this book and this history of how early that happens i'm like wait a minute there was all this other shit that happened after that but yeah i think traditionally mm -hmm. and i do think this might be some element of that like sort of great figure of history like i was going to say great man of history but even you know like women or men or whoever 
you know, this idea of like, well, once those figures die, then like history stops or there isn't this other sort of like context and like much more uh, nuanced, interesting background. And I wonder about that, you know, is that like a symptomatic thing about how we still uh, relate to history on the left? Is that, oh yeah, like once Leibniz and Lutzenberg, Lutzenberg dies and everything else, it's like, oh, all of a sudden, like history just doesn't, like history dissolves for us. And so I think this book is a good corrective to that. But yeah, also yeah. like I, I never knew about any of the actual developments and what was really going on at this point mm-hmm. outside of just, yeah, vague sort of like uh, kind of holding up Leibniz and Lutzenberg as these like great moral figures, which I'm not opposed to that. But again, there's a lot more happening. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, Carl, Leibniz and Lutzenberg were these really great figures. I don't want to minimize that at all. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Lutzenberg, you can see a world where she survives, where she could have been very vital in perhaps the success of the German Revolution. Because yeah. a big thing that you lack here is, and you don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like as simple as this, but like, you really do lack like good leadership in the way that the Russians have with Lenin and then Trotsky. You just really don't see, I think maybe the closest they get is Brandler way later on. He seems, if not necessarily to have the resolve, he would want to at least be committed and not as rash as some of the other people you see. But I mean, it's it's complicated. So just to kind of get into Spartacus uprising, it happens in early January. There was a police commissioner who the right-wing national government, I think, want, or the more right-wing, relative to everything that's happening, uh, wants canned, which triggered strikes and protests in support of him. Now, just because of the political situation, these pretty quickly spiraled out of control, as far as I can tell, mm-hmm. to the point where the governments felt threatened. It was unclear if this was like an actual revolutionary moment or if it was just a bunch of strikes. And there was this huge upsurging of a desire for an open revolution, I think, from the streets, from the rank and file. But what you see is the UPD <laughs> and the KPD form a like revolutionary strike committee, basically to uh, organize the ongoing strike. And eventually the UPD aspect of it decides to enter into negotiations with the SPD government. The KPD leaves the uh, Revolutionary Committee and there's this moment of hesitation where the people in the streets... So when you have this moment where you have this like kind of revolutionary strike moment, we were talking about taking grasp of the moment is very important because when you hesitate, it saps all of the... Well, this is something Harmon says, actually. When mm-hmm. you hesitate, you sap all of the energy from that movement. Yeah. What happens is... People lose their confidence and uh, they kind of are milling around and people start to go home. People start to go back to work and it kind of just all falls apart. And then with that as a background, the Fry Corps starts to move in on January 8th and it's very brutal. They It's very it's basically just repression of the working class and any yep. working class uh, power. If you're a worker, they search your house. And if you have a gun or any sort of weapon, you're, pretty, you're probably just going to be executed on the spot. Very, very grim stuff. Um, they used artillery on residential areas. They had these armored cars, which were kind of proto-tanks. Gruesome stuff. Um, eventually, late on the night of January 15th, Liebknecht and Luxembourg are discovered and captured by the Frey Corps. Uh, Liebknecht was beaten up and shot in the head, and Luxembourg was very, very brutally beaten, probably to death, and then they shot her. They left them in a ditch. Mm-hmm. And that is... Generally seen as the end of the Spartacus uprising, it carries on, the violence carries on maybe for a week. and But that is not the end of the German Revolution, <laughs> um, notably. Yeah. Uh, because, well, I don't know if you have anything to say. For that. Well, I just want to touch on one thing here in terms of the relationship between Nazca and Ebert and the the brutal repression of the Spartacus League. So this is on my page 67. It says, uh, General Groner told a libel court in 1925 that as early as the 29th of December, and this is, quote, Ebert ordered Nazca to lead troops against the Spartacus. The volunteer corps assembled that day and everything was ready for the opening of hostilities. Even before, like, everything starts popping off, like... Nazca and Ebert were already just at the ready to unleash this brutal violence on on the working classes. And I also wanted to see, did you see how many people actually died? I have written down 200 plus Mm -hmm. was the number that I came away with. I'm not sure if that's totally accurate. Mm. I I have to assume it's probably more see the size of Berlin. Where do you want to go next? So after, it's kind of hard to describe really like the whole of what's going on in Germany and this book does a good job of it because everything is highly localized. So you have this going on in Berlin, but I mean, it's not, first off, Germany is not like France, which is kind of like 
my reference point for understanding like European revolutionary things. And in France, everything pretty much runs through Paris because Paris more or less spent all of French history subjugating the rest of France. Yeah. <laughs> um, Germany's not like that, even though like even now it's a federal republic. And then it was a federal republic, more or less. So even though in Berlin, the left was like pretty brutally oppressed, that's not the end of it in the rest of the country. And it's not even the end of it in Berlin. Four months later, they're popping off again. So Harman goes through a chapter that he calls a month of civil war. And it really is, we don't talk about it, but it really is kind of like a German civil war. You see in Bremen, on the Rhine, in later on in Bavaria, this same kind of pattern is uh, repeated where you, you see workers' councils and, and nominally socialistic groups start to take power, but oftentimes they kind of turn around to the social democrats and give them power. Sometimes they don't. In cases where you don't, that's when I think when you typically see the Freikorps come in, that's yeah. when you see the repression. And he talks about this happening in Bremen really tragically. He talks about this happening in the Rhine. And then we get to Bavaria, which is kind of an interesting case. Uh, Bavaria is the southern, southeastern state of Germany. Historically speaking, it was kind of its own thing. You know, in the Middle Ages, Germany was like this huge patchwork of stuff from Austria to Prussia over maybe to the Netherlands, depending on who you ask. So Bavaria always, because of that, as a center of power in the Middle Ages, I think, would argue, kind of retained this notion of independence more so than other regions of Germany. So by the time you get to the collapse of the German Empire, by the time you get to all this stuff happening, there's a lot of folks within Bavaria who would like independence, which could have happened. You have Woodrow Wilson talking about uh, self-determination with an asterisk, and then you go to the asterisk and it says, for people in the former Austrian, Russian, and German empires. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's going off about that, so, you, so it makes sense. And you have this guy, Kurt Eisner, who was initially a more right-wing leaning social democrat, initially supported the war, eventually switched, spent eight months in jail, um, was just involved in the revolutionary left scene in Munich, which is the capital of Bavaria. This whole thing in Bavaria is pretty complicated because initially you get the people's state of Bavaria, which is nominally socialist, but not, Ebert openly declares that private property will be uh, protected. He's trying to op- like attract the more moderate nationalist force or like, political forces to help give him more of a base. At this point, he's with the UPD, and he's the minister president of this uh, people's state of Bavaria that is in the German Republic but it's a fluid situation. Because this is all happening before Versailles was signed. Yeah. So, I mean, this is when they were deciding what would and wouldn't be in Germany. And it, like I said, it could have been possible that, like, if things gone another way, you could have had an independent Bavaria. That's neither here nor there. So, Eisner, things aren't going great. He's not in a very strong position. There's an election. He loses. He's on the way to the parliament building to basically concede defeat. And he's assassinated by a right-wing nationalist. And that sets off uh, the second more chaotic, more farcical, as Harmon would probably put it, idiotic round of the Bavarian episode. Which, frankly, I, even after reading the book, was, like, really not supremely clear on, like, what happened. I think this was probably the section of the book that I came away with the least, I guess. And maybe that's partially because of the nature of the situation itself or, like, how Harmon writes the history. But I remember coming, it was like, all right, well, there was a whole lot of facts and dates there. I'm not really sure what to make of all that shit, but it's there. Yeah, there's Ernst Toller uh, tries to form a government. I I don't think it's successful. There is also Eugene, you're sorry, Eugene Levine who uh, seized power with the Communist Party, Mm -hmm. it looks like. Yeah, I was talking about the influence of Moscow and all of this, and you start to see this in the Bavarian episode. Oftentimes, everybody is trying with good intentions, but when you're in a world where, you know, communication technology is what it is, Mm -hmm. people don't know. People who are in, like, near the Caucasus don't know what's going on in Munich. So this Eugene Levine character, I think, had the blessings of Moscow, but... It didn't go very well. Eventually, the Freikorps move in at the uh, request of the the Berlin-aligned Social Democratic government led by this fellow, Johannes Hoffman. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, the Freikorps move in, and it's kind of a repeat of what you see throughout the country. Really brutal. Hoffman, I think, also tragically ends up in a concentration camp or yeah. killed Nazis. It's, it's just this... 
<laughs> like really enjoy this book, but it's all it's very depressing. Yeah, it's very dark. It's very heavy. Yeah, but that sort of takes us to uh, Cat Putsch, which is the next sort of set piece that you see. Do you have anything you wanted to hit on? No, no, no. I think that was pretty brilliantly summed up. So I think, yeah, if you want to just keep moving forward, by all means. Sweet. So the Cat Putsch is this attempt, one of the first attempts by the German right wing to research. So uh, throughout this book, a lot of what he's talking about, which like it makes sense, a lot of what he's talking about is the German workers' movement and then kind of how the communist social democrats and the independent social democrats affect and relate to that. So this is kind of the first time where you see the right come back, and it was an attempted coup led by uh, Wolfgang Kapp, who was a Prussian civil servant um, involved in the administration. And one thing to note is that when the Social Democrats came to power in the German Republic, they tried as much as possible to make sure that any sort of royal functionaries or imperial holdovers in the administration were kept over because they didn't want to change the administration of the state at all, really. Uh, that would benefit them. So the context of the cat push is after I said earlier that Versailles had not been signed. We're talking about 1920 now. So Versailles has been signed. Mm -hmm. Versailles being signed really through German politics uh, into chaos because they emboldened all of these right wing parties, which up to now had been entirely discredited because of their support of the war. Like up to this point, the SPD is really the only power in Germany, as far as I'm concerned, or not the only power, but like they are the biggest, most centralized power. The government runs through them. After this, it's kind of the first challenge. Uh, so the German government at the time was in a coalition government with uh, one of the bourgeois parties. So basically you have this new centralized German army, which exists after the uh, Treaty of Versailles, which reduces German population. An interesting thing, if you ever look at like population tables of Germany in this era, it goes down because of World War One. Mm. Then it goes down a lot more and you're like, wait, the population is growing, but then you lose five million people. Where does that happen? Well, that's because like lots of areas like Alsace, Lorraine, some areas of Poland, part of Denmark, they're no longer part of Germany anymore. Which, whenever you see, I mean, John Dolan and Mark Ames on Radio Warner do a great job in their earlier episodes, especially of talking about how it affects a culture. And this is probably like the textbook event of how defeat affects a Western culture, mm. where you just start to see this rise of ultra nationalism, right wing opposition to the government. And like, it's really easy for the right wing because they're not in government, they don't have the same of anything on their hands to pose counter to the SPD, German Democratic Party coalition government. Yeah, actually, on that note, and since we were kind of talking about Ebert and Noska and the relationship between, again, like, leadership of the SPD and the development of the Freikorps, it's a couple of paragraphs, but I thought this was really uh, just drives all this home. So this is a couple of hours before the the cap push. Uh, Harmon says, only hours before the coup, Noska told a Social Democrat colleague, uh, Kuttner, that he had every confidence that the generals would continue to support the legal government. It is hardly surprising that there was a widespread belief on the, among the military conspirators that once the coup was successful, Noska and Ebert would support or even join a new government. And then we were talking about how they kind of unleashed something that they ended up like they didn't realize what forces they were like coalescing and unleashing. This is Harmony says, though they would not go so far as to join the coup, they were powerless to stop it. They had spent 14 months reinstating the state apparatus as a mechanism beyond popular control. Now they found they could not control it themselves. They helped ensure that almost the entire officer corps adhered to monarchistic principles and conservative social ideas. They could hardly rely upon it now to stop a right-wing coup. So for me, that couple of paragraphs there was just a really, yeah, just uh, deeply tragic and just infuriating, yeah, just summary of the the effects of what Nasca and Ebert actually unleashed. And, and again, like creating this sort of kernel of what would eventually become the Nazi party. Yeah. And uh, I mean, some of the, I think... I want to say Ludendorff might have had a role in this, but I mean, Ludendorff, who was the, one of the guys who was a uh, basically the head of German general staff, one of the dictators during the war, he played a role in, you know, the rise of the Nazi party. He was like one of the political patron, yeah, political patrons of Hitler, I think, at some mm -hmm. point. So, yeah, yeah these are, are the people who do that shit. And it is like, my God. Uh, so basically, there is this failed army coup. Um, the army wanted to do a dictatorship just to smash the uh, left wing, because another thing we don't talk about history is that after the Bolshevik revolution happened in, in 1917, I think across the world, the right, not even the right, just like all bourgeois political parties and formations just lost their fucking mind. Oh, yeah. For a period, partially forever and partially for a period of time. But that's why you see fascism in Italy, really, because they were the most vocal, hardcore anti-communist. And that's like a very 
important motivating factor of all of this right wing fascistic thought. Yep. So it's pretty like I think if the cat Butch had you know been successful, you would have seen some like if not like some weird quasi fascist like thing. Not maybe probably not as bad as Nazis, but Nazis are a step above in history. Um, in yeah, exactly. Worldness. There is a general strike, um, even if the coup may have militarily been pretty successful. Uh, the KPD and the UPD called out a general strike, which was very successful. It kind of just debilitated all of Germany. I think the railroads stopped running effectively. The army couldn't transport troops. Um, they just had no ability to actually implement power after this coup. And it put the left in a pretty strong position because the right is delegitimated or delegitimized after attempting to seize power outside of the constitution but failing. So the KPD is calling on the SPD, I think, to purge the right wing as much as possible, take them, like, remove the positions of power in the military, disarm right wing political formations, censor right wing press, the usual kind of 19, 19 revolutionary cocktail, uh, mm-hmm. which would have been useful, probably should have done it, but the SPD just refuses to even really cap, spend some time in jail. Ludwitz, who was part of this, who's another high ranking officer, I think he might have spent some time in jail too, but aside from that, Nobody really was punished. I mean, the military, the same people were running it afterwards. A lot of the military, as you mentioned, didn't openly support the coup, but didn't do anything to oppose it because they were trying to see how shit would turn out. Yep. So it could have been this point where, you know, the German Revolution maybe puts itself on a path to something close to democracy or stability or <laughs> not hell. But it didn't because the SPD was still more concerned Somehow, after this coup attempt from the right wing, more concerned with the communists than they were with the right wing. Yeah, I'm looking at, was it the communist party at this point that basically, Harmon is saying like in response to the cap putsch, um, that meant that they did not attempt to seize power themselves or insisted that social democrats fight around a program for the dictatorship of the proletariat. Instead, they proposed joint action to the social democratic leaders around a list of demands, which these leaders could hardly refuse if they were serious about resisting the putsch, purging the middle class from the home guard, the transformation of the rest of the home guard into a workers' army, a takeover of Freikorps barracks, and dissolution of the Freikorps, a takeover, a takeover of all official buildings, and the election of delegates to a workers' councils, uh, to a workers' council from all the factories. I gather that what Harmon is kind of getting at here is that, you know, as opposed to like seizing on this momentum of the success of the general strike. Instead, they kind of just align themselves with the Social Democrats and come up with some sort of compromise. And, and sort of, it's a huge misstep. You know, it's a huge failure to actually seize the momentum of the moment. And, I mean, it seems like that was also, like, again, even though it was after, it was like later on in the German Revolution, it was one of those moments where something could have happened or it could have yeah. created this nucleus of what eventually would become, yeah, I mean, maybe something like we could call a dictatorship of the proletariat, but it was it was missed for a compromise instead. Yeah, that kind of the communist party even really failing to take take the moment has an effect because it takes us to the next. I don't have this really on the outline. I have the kind of this on the outline. It takes us to March 1921. The UPD is... You know, we've been talking about common turn. They're trying to decide if they want to join the common turn. And the common turn comes with this list of requirements, demands that says, all right, if you want to join, you have to do this, 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 and this. They basically merge with the KPD. So about half did that, um, and it formed the United Communist Party of Germany. And it was huge. I want to say it had 500,000 members. It was like the Communist Party had never been big, that's this big before this. It was always a fairly marginal political formation, maybe influential within... I know it was influential with the Berlin shop or the Berlin uh, metal workers, I want to say. Yeah. The radical mm-hmm. shop stewards was a, another group, uh, but they didn't have widespread influence across the working class. And they didn't after the merger, but they had 500,000 members is a lot more than, you know, 50,000 members. So there was this, uh, and he describes in this section kind of all of these developments within the party, the development of an ultra left current within the party was really pushing for action. He also talks about the left wing of the Communist Party breaks off to form the Communist Workers Party at mm-hmm. this time. That's, I'm not going to pretend to really know a lot about background of why that happened. I know that the Communist Workers Party plays a role later on in German history. Well, he says that, so this is in April 1920. Uh, so yeah. the KPD met at a conference um, and formed the Communist Workers Party, so the KAPD as opposed to just the KPD, and claimed a membership of 38,000. So it's interesting here because Harmon is saying that the, uh, the KAPD has occasionally been represented as the first anti-Moscow opposition 
to break with like quote unquote orthodox communism, but he says like that isn't the case. And he says it's not entirely correct to describe the KAPDA as ultra left. So yeah, I don't know if you want to like dig into, okay, well like then what the hell were they? Yeah, the vibe I get, maybe not, yeah, maybe not ultra left, but like very aggressive. If I remember that it, they wanted something to happen, which makes sense. Cause I think that there was this current within the party or just like the movement of this frustration that after the cat push, there was this lost opportunity that had been squandered in attempting to work with the social Democrats. Yeah. And I think that frustration in that sense that kind of drove the formation, the breakaway of the left wing into the KAPD is really what I think uh, the existence of the KAPD starting to potentially flanking the KAPD created this curtain in the party that wanted to do something. It's interesting, too, because Harmon is saying that it seems like there were two kind of currents in the KAPD. So there's one that's from Laufenberg and uh, Wolfheim. It basically is developing a theory that led away from militant class struggle. But then there's another current that sounds like it's much more influenced by kind of the Dutch communists like Panikek and Gorder. That's basically yeah. saying like, you know, we got to build up these institutions and in civil society to challenge capitalism. So again, it sounds like, yeah, there's just multiple tendencies that are happening all within this uh, this breakaway formation. I mean, which makes sense. I mean, this whole period of time before this the way that we interact, I think, with all these ideologies was yeah. like, stultified and codified yeah definitely so he talks about the march action my page is almost 200 Mm -hmm. not sure where it would be it's in chapter 10 so towards the beginning of chapter 10 the heading is the march action so let's talk about the background an important thing is that a lot of our like workers have kept arms that they had in the clashes between the freight corps in 1919 something we don't think about a lot is Germany is probably a pretty heavily armed uh society at this point just because the conditions of the collapse of the army leaving lots of weapons behind. Yep. And the fact that you have these like things that people call red armies, which is just kind of like large, fairly unorganized militia of workers that spring up at times in the Rhine, start yeah. to clash with the Frey Corps. Yeah, um, also like the other one is the Ruhr Red Army as well. It seems like that one kind of gets referenced a few times. Yeah, that actually might be what I mean when I, or, or I'm trying to reference when I keep saying the Rhine. But yeah, the Ruhr Red Army. And the March action was an attempt, as far as I could tell. I don't think that there was a clear conception in the part of the party of what it was supposed to be. Because uh, it's like this pretty classic action you see where people go out on strike, things get pretty heated, people feel like maybe this can be a chance to retake power. And then the leader of the strike enters into negotiations with the central government, which saps all the power. And then, you know, the central government moves in and violently represses everybody, which for the time, Really, really sapped the power of the Communist Party. I know a lot of its leadership was in jail after this. Lost a lot of members. And the book kind of time warps past 1922 because after the March action, the party was just a ghost of itself. And it took two years to get back to anything close to where it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the March action is emphasized. And my main takeaway was that it was really weird, very stupid. <laughs> 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 not very well thought out. Well, it's weird. I mean, I do think there is an increasing sense of like desperation and confusion at this point in the revolution as well. I mean, this so this is on 204 under the subheading, the KPD leadership splits. But I do think this is, you know, just to kind of bring this out and clarify. So Harman says the main thesis running through this book so far has been that the German revolution was defeated because of the absence of even the nucleus of a cohesive party in November 1918. At each point afterwards, this initial lack plagued the movement, preventing any coherent direction, being given to upsurges of revolutionary anger within the working class. And he says that at first sight, that March action, like, doesn't seem to fit into this. But then I think he's basically like, no, it actually does fit into this. Like, it (laughs) wasn't wasn't organized. It wasn't very well thought out. So I wanted to ask you, too, because you mentioned Brandler a little bit ago. And this is also where Brandler and even, like, Bella Kroon come into play a bit. Just to go back, I did have that start um, that the main phase of the book is that the German Revolution defeated because of the absence of even a nucleus of base party. And I think that, like, I don't necessarily... Necessarily, I think that's like true, and also probably some other things are. Yeah, so when he's talking about Brandler and the theory of the offensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I thought that might be interesting to touch on at least for a, a moment of like the the influence or I guess like the effect of what the theory of the offensive was. Yeah, as far as I can tell, the theory into the offense, the theory of the offensive is that like because the bourgeois state was like not fully recovered from any of the crisis years that uh, the communist and the workers ought to adopt a strategy of offensive action, mm-hmm. um, which I think kind of 
probably plays into that current you're talking about the KAPD, which is like building working class institutions, but in such a way that is not like defensive as yeah. you would have seen pretty much everywhere up to this point. Yeah. And I mean, Harbin is pretty disparaging, I think, to the theory of the offensive, at least in like the context that they were existing in. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, this is where he says that this was a doctrine that was propagated by Bukharin in Moscow and accepted to varying degrees by Zinoviev, Belikun, Radic, the New German Center, and the Berlin left of uh, Friesland, Fischer, and Maslow. And if there were two figures that I came away with whenever I first read this of being like, I read it to those people now, it was Fisher and Maslow. They were just kind of such prime examples of just like hyper voluntarist, damn near like wrecker kind of types. And just seemed like they sowed like sectarianism and division and just had this like hardcore stance that just wreaked havoc on any kind of ability to build solidarity across these different factions. Yeah, there are at least one and maybe multiple point where you're talking about Fisher, like will say one thing and then turn around and criticize it after it fails. Yes. Or she'll like make it seem like she'd always been more radical and in fact was like wavering on certain yep. um, things. And they, yeah, they really do seem like, oh God. <laughs> For people like that, it's not hard to understand how things went the way that they did. Yeah, and I think that's like really important too, is I think we can balance out talking about these larger structural factors and also just recognizing, yeah, the sort of failures or the the radical missteps and just damn near subversive kind of shit that people like Fisher and Maslow were doing to actually undermine what potential the working classes actually had. So this is 221. He's giving a little background on them. He says, the, the two young Berlin-based intellectuals, Ruth Fisher and Arkady Maslow, reveled in the internal sectarianism playing at the banning of centrism. Articulate and energetic, they were able to gather around them many of the new workers who had joined the party from the independence despite their own lack of anything beyond the crudest grasp of marxism he has some awesome uh nobody's really disparaging something his pros can get really really good yeah he's good he's pretty he's pretty cutting yeah he's got he's got some sharp daggers i'll give him that yeah some of my favorite parts of this book are chapters like the one i think we're kind of vaguely on now like the end of the march madness where he really like stops and takes stock of um what's going on like the bounce of the first year it's an awesome chapter Year of the Crisis in the Hot Summer, which we're about to get into. Those are awesome chapters. Yeah, yeah. So I really, again, the thing to take away from this kind of period and this start to see splits, start to see people like this is like this repeated series of failures is probably having a, it's starting to add up. Like there's junk in the system because it's keep fucking up. And that is yeah. going to really come into like this kind of climactic part of the book that comes next, which is where he starts to talk about 1923. Mm-hmm. Um which also, we should probably reference the uh, is it the Rhine occupation that the French did starting in 1922, 1923, because that plays yes. background into this. Does he touch on that in this particular? Yeah, so he talks about, we're talking about the Great Crisis. So is it the Ruhr, where the French occupied part of the Ruhr? Because they had occupied the Rhineland, and then they moved on to the Ruhr. Yeah. And that was because it was really complicated. There was like an inflation crisis, which was being exacerbated by the industrialists because... It was beneficial to them, and also I think it made it more difficult for the Allies to actually collect and warn deputy payments. And so yeah. a big part of the French occupying the war was actually they were owed so many pounds of coal per year. So they were like, we're going to get that damn coal. And the war was the major coal-producing area. Tons of coal fields, which oftentimes... There was a Trobillies episode. They have this series called Year Zero, and there's this episode where he talk, this, they talked to this guy about coal... And how, like, that spurred labor organization versus oil, which didn't. Um, so coal is industry, which, for some reason, spurs lots of labor organization. That episode is with Timothy Mitchell, who wrote the book Carbon Democracy. That episode is yeah. fantastic. And the whole reason is because with oil, you can start to actually transmit things over pipelines. And it isolates workers in a way that doesn't allow them to collectively organize within a shared like labor context. So that book, we've actually talked about doing that on the show before, and I would highly recommend it. It's a great book. Put it on my list. Yeah, and that's so true because, you know, the coal workers, their strike would not have been as significant without the railroad workers striking in solidarity because then you can't transport the coal. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so there's this, you know, terrible crisis of inflation in Germany. Uh, And there's also intertwined with unemployment. And uh, nobody in the revolutionary left had, like, I think at this point they probably thought the moment was over, Mm -hmm. um, which plays into what happened at this point. You start to see over the summer of 1923, this, things were actually going pretty well up to March and April 1923. Wages were rising as far as I can tell. There was 
food. Things are as probably good as they might have been since 1914 for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see inflation just like it's in, unimaginable. People would be paid and run to the store before midday when prices were raised because if they made it late, then their wages weren't worth anything. So you start to see a bunch of labor activism around this, like tons of strikes, requisition committees, control committees. It's like Germany gets as, as crazy as it was in 1919, arguably. So that goes through this summer, just kind of casually going over it or, or quickly going over it. And it gets to this point where uh, I have some notes here. Sorry, just to describe how bad it was. Yeah. The cost of living increased 165 percent between September 13th and September 19th. My God. Uh, it took one hour's work for a miner to buy one egg. <laughs> uh, wages were less than half the subsistence level for a family of four, down 15 to 20% for pre-war levels. Like, it was so, wow. so bad. Yeah. You see government after government collapse because of this. Like, there's political instability. There's economic and social instability. And eventually, eventually, the party... And Moscow starts to realize, okay, something here can be taken advantage of, which starts just planning for, you had to sense there was lots of uh, sense of poetry in all this, because they planned a big uprising for November, sorry, for October. Um, it was called it German October, and I think the parallels were very conscious between the October Revolution in 1917. Um, Harman talks about at this point, the revolutionaries in Russia were pretty bad shape compared with the beginning of this book. Uh, Lenin was dying. The workers, for the most part, were all dead from the Civil War. Uh, the party was bureaucratized and becoming more authoritarian. Mm -hmm. Stalin was consolidating power. Um, for Harmon is very bad. Very bad. It wasn't yeah. good. <laughs> it's not totally wrong, but which, Regrettable Century is doing a round tale about Stalin, so whenever you're listening to this, Go listen to that. Yeah, um, as we speak, they're doing that right now. So yeah. we're, we're with them in comradely spirit. Yes. I know that, you know, whenever Harmon's talking about the origins of this, like, great crisis, so we're talking about the inflation crisis, talking about the situation on the Ruhr, but then we're also going to talk about the nationalist right. So I don't know if you want to jump into that, but there was a... There was one small section that I thought was really, uh, really good and sort of connecting dots between what's happening now and, again, sort of this – at least one element of the kernel of what would eventually become fascism in, in Germany. Yeah, you start to see – well, for one, the right is actually in power, at least in September. Um, Stressman government and then there's the Kuno government. Yeah, so the Kuno government, there were lots of strikes and lots of um, protests – well, maybe not, but, you know, maybe labor, mainly labor related actions that eventually succeeded in um, forcing this very right wing government to resign in 1923. Generally part of this resurgence of the right wing that you see in German politics um, before that. I think that this is the first time since the revolution that the SPD is not like the leading party in government. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know if you had anything specific to say about that kind of rising current. Yeah, well, there's a short paragraph on 235 I thought was interesting, and this might be something to think about in relevance to politics today. Harmon says, by 1922, however, dis disillusion with the Republic had really set in. The right was growing in strength and aggressiveness, and alongside the old conservative right, there had grown a new militant extreme right based on a core of former Fry Corps members. These were the men who murdered Erzberger in 1921 and Rathenau in 1922, and who carried out another 351 political assassinations in four years. So just that sort of like marrying of this like new uh, militant extreme right with the sort of old conservative right, I thought was uh, just sort of a key distinction, how those are two different things, but they're, again, they're sort of unifying mm -hmm. together. And it's important to note that, you know, those two working together isn't necessarily a guarantee. I mean, a lot of the old right. conservative, like uh, aristocratic right, horrified and disgusted by like this kind of quasi-fascistic, yep. new nationalist, like very, very violent, right-wing movement that was starting that would become the nazis and the parties that were like you know the nazi party came out of many right-wing radical insane fashion parties and yeah no it's absolutely important to point out because uh and i think it's definitely overwrought to compare america in 2020 to germany in 1920 because you know they had a political culture in germany for better or worse they did <laughs> I don't think that we do like yeah people always talk about oh there'll be a civil war in america who's gonna fight it <laughs> It'll be like, who? It's, <laughs> it's going to be the right wing Nazi furries against anarcho kitties. Against the FBI, yeah. 
It's like, who's good? I don't know. Yeah. But, but anyway, I don't want to make the comparison directly, but like, you can see, okay, hey, crisis in like capital, yeah, and also just like in the bourgeois liberal state, lots yeah. of falling confidence in that. We certainly have that now, but definitely points out a lot of where you go later in this story. So there are these things called the proletarian hundreds, which we never really talked about. They played a role earlier in the book in some of the earlier actions, and they're basically kind of like the Red Armies, like these, they're a little bit better organized, I think, probably like working class militia, kind of represents an armed working class power in the country. Uh, they were part of this planning for this uprising in October 1923. They were thought to have a theoretical strength. I'm not going to go into, I wrote a lot of down about kind of the preparations for this, um, which just shows how serious Moscow and uh, Berlin were. Proletarian hundreds had a theoretical strength of 60 to 100,000 members, or at least 60 to 100,000 guns. 800 cells across Germany by the time we get to October. They were just, like, the party spent all of its effort effectively trying to prepare. Uh, they created a whole military, like, they divided Germany into military districts, created a whole command apparatus. Like, they were at least serious about it. The party was ready for a civil war. At least they were preparing for a civil war. They were receiving aid and training from the Red Army, the, Red, the Soviet Red Army. Herman talks about how the preparations, which really consumed all party activity, came at the expense of actually explaining why they were doing this to mm -hmm. the rank and file, yeah. to the workers, the fellow travelers, the people who like aren't part of the party, but are the people who you know, influence, because everybody was focusing on preparing for this uprising, which... This is one of like one of the interesting, most interesting parts of the book because it's kind of like ratcheting up, ratcheting up to this, and it never happened. There was never even an attempt at an uprising. It just didn't happen. Um, everybody was terrified of repeating March 1921, which Harmon points to as having this really, really traumatic effect on the German party. Which I think is eventually one of his explanations for why. The revolution eventually wasn't successful. It's because of that yeah. misstep in 21 and the fear of that eventually, yeah, like paralyzed the party from actually engaging in this uprising. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's hard to argue that's not true. But also it's, <laughs> you don't know what, you don't think that they're necessarily wrong because like I was talking about way at the beginning of this. Um, so I, I was think gaming out, like say that they launched this abortive rebellion. The French occupy the Ruhr. Italy is entrenched fascist at this point in the mm -hmm. south yep um i'm pretty sure at this point it's like the period where the british were more friendly to them so there's that the polish are like vehemently anti-communist at this point and they're not that's not a country you necessarily want to go to war with they just beat the soviets and i i i wouldn't have wanted to fight the polish in 1923 so even had they actually launched this rebellion i think maybe it would have worked and at one point armin puts he says that this a successful German revolution could have revigorated or rejuvenated the Russian revolution, which at this point was stalling out in his yeah. mind. And I think that's probably true, but I don't think it's clear that you would have gotten a successful German revolution because like, you would have either seen World War II really, really soon or, or something like Syria in Germany where it starts yeah. to break apart and there's this part and there's this part and there's this part and... Yeah, just complete yeah. like balkanization and yeah, just unleashing of just massive violence. I will say this is a, uh, we're getting like real close to the end here, but like on 296, he has this great paragraph about Brandler and sort of Brandler's mm -hmm. role in all of this. He says, Brandler had gotten himself and the German revolution into an impossible position. He had expected the left social democrats to agree to a project that they well knew meant civil war, even if they did not know of the secret communist preparations for it. But the left social democrats were, for all their good intentions, still social democrats. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I love that. It's such a snarky line. <laughs> Oh, yeah. They had boundless faith in the possibilities of compromise and were not prepared to abandon these possibilities for a revolutionary gamble, however desperate the situation. They had believed the government's claim that the army, army was moving in to deal with Bavaria, and they would not abandon that belief until the army itself made continued ignorance of its real aims impossible. After all, they figured they could not yet be certain that there would be no continued role for social democratic politicians. Yeah, and that right there, there they were not certain that there'd be no continued role for social democratic politicians. That was the Demo the social democratic position up to the end. Exactly. Like, the social democratic leader stood up when Hitler was confirmed as chancellor and said, you're the legal lawful government and we're with you. A lot of them got 
murdered or thrown in concentration camps. It sure did. Just, we always talk about, like in capitalist realism, kind of talks about like the sense of future has been foreclosed upon. Yeah. Kind of feel like the social Democrats idea of future had been foreclosed upon. Their only conception of like what could exist is like this version of status quo where, mm -hmm. you know, the, the liberal bourgeois are in power, but... You know, we're making games, whatever the fuck they're worth. Yeah, I think it's just um, resigning yourself to, well, let's eke out whatever compromise we can. Let's eke out whatever positions of power we can. Maybe there's still a role for us, and that's it. Yeah, very tragic stuff. Yeah. This whole part of the book, I think, is the most in, most useful. Uh, I took a lot of notes. Yeah, it also all came nothing. So the revolutionary movement in Germany kind of collapsed after this, mm -hmm. which makes sense. You can only tell people, like, this had been, like, I don't know, the fifth time something like this has happened where the people are like, okay, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and then the party, whatever party it is, whatever political formation just melts away and the people are left to get... They weren't slaughtered in this case, luckily, but in every other case, the people were left to be slaughtered. Which is, um, again, makes total sense why there would be such severe hesitation about this. Because if it fails, yeah. essentially, yeah, you're, you're making them incredibly vulnerable to just further repression and violence. Yeah, if they'd done something like this in, like, 1919 before they had this kind of, like, even because, like, the, the Spartacus uprising didn't even have this effect on the party. Yep. They were ready to keep going after yep. that. It was... March 9th. And I think it's because at least the Spartacus uprising, there was a ethos there. It was like, it was about something. It was in that days right after the November Revolution where it's mm -hmm. like, maybe it's still possible. 1921 was just kind of like, all right, we got all this muscle. Let's flex it. Yep. Whoops. Yeah. All the social democratic ministers resigned from the central government. I put in parentheses their beloved role to play. <laughs> um, <laughs> They were then excluded from government for the next five years. Um, Right-wingers attempted the Beer Hall push, which was led by our little shit Adolf Hitler. Unemployment went up 28%. 42% of workers were on short time. The eight-hour workday was scrapped. Everything that they had even gained back from the end of the war was lost. Yeah, it was it gone. Was bad. And it's weird. It's like nothing even happened, but German capital regained. There was this huge crisis we were talking about, and they regained their footing after the crisis and smashed the left. Yep. And this whole part of the book, I think, is my favorite because it goes into, like, the whole end of, what was it, the German October into the legacy of defeat, which is some of the, it's the shortest chapter, but some of the best writing in this yeah, book. Yeah, I would agree. Um, he just, yeah, talks about the failure. And this, I think, the 1923 is really the failure of the German Revolution in such a way where after this, there's never anything like this again. There's never an almost, like, this is it. Yeah, there's one paragraph that he has i think is just absolute oh here you go those who believed in capitalism with the human face in the orderly march towards socialization in the anchoring of the councils in the constitution only ensured that all europe was subjected to a medieval barbarism armed with the monstrous devices of modern technology i want to i want to tag another paragraph on here this is this is one of my favorite paragraphs in the whole book he says, Hitler could not have come to power if he had relied just upon stormtroopers. He also depended upon the active collaboration of those forces in German society which had been given a new lease of life by social democrat governments in November to December of 1918 and April 1920. The generals, the top government bureaucrats, the great industrialists, and landed interests. These had dominated all the governments since 1923 with a brief interlude of social democratic rule in 1928 to 1930. So again, just kind of one of those, uh, yeah, just devastating paragraphs. I mean, it's a collective ruin of humanity for a, a while. That's the consequence. Yep, it's that is every, the consequence. Like, kind of, like, I think sometimes, like the idea of apocalypse, sometimes there is an apocalypse. Sometimes the world actually does end. Like, it keeps going, but, like, yeah. I think in 1945, the world kind of ended. So, like, he's really right, I think, to paint it in those kind of, like, really hardcore terms, which takes us, I think, to the closing section, the question, like lessons from the book, I kind of put like revolution is always a near run thing. And that's one thing it really took away. It was like, it's chaotic, it's near run yep. and works out. It's like kind of a little random and a little lucky. And that's, you know, happens. That's how the world is. Yeah. It requires you to genuinely understand the conditions under which you're operating and understand the people you claim to be leading. We have to strive to continue to do that in our world because we probably understand our world a lot less than they understood their world. Yes, I, I yeah. understand our world a lot less anyway. I sometimes can say we when I, I mean me. That's all right, a little projection never hurt anybody. I think you're right um, though. I mean, if, I think if there's anything that studying the history of revolutions has, and I think, you know, listening to things on like Radio War Nerd and just trying to really grapple with this history, not through this like weird mythologized leftist kind of ideology, it's that chance, contingency, randomness, 
And these seemingly things that don't appear to be inconsequential become massively determinant in some sort of ways. And I think that that has to be taken very, very seriously. Any, anytime anyone talks about, you know, again, like, oh, like we want to wage revolution. It's like, well, how do you think a revolution happens? Where do you think it comes from? You know, what do you think determines whether it's successful or not? And I think, you know, the German revolution for me and, and even a book, even just reading one book on it like this one, I think will divest you of many illusions and also really, I think, give you a very sober and hopefully much more humble idea of like what that word actually means. The part of the book I think that really sunk that in for me was the preparations for this kind of almost abortive revolution. It is just like how serious it felt like. And this is like the German party had just watched the Russian Civil War happen. That was right next door. Yeah. So they, they were like, oh, okay, we watched that happen. And that was like the most violent, horrifying clusterfuck of an internal conflict you've probably ever seen in human history up to that point. Yeah. And they were like, all right, <laughs> let's do that here. Uh, <laughs> so for all their faults, they were fucking about that life. They were. Uh, Can't You got to give them credit for that. <laughs> yeah, more so than I might be. <laughs> Which is strange, like you said, though. And I mean, I part of me, and this is maybe my therapist brain kicking in, but whenever you think about that hesitation after the March action, you know, part of me has to wonder, it's like, I mean, God, was it just like, you know, you go through that amount of like social and political trauma and just violence and repression enough times. Is it fairly understandable? Like why you would deeply have a sense of avoidance or it would then almost be, yeah, like kind of so paralyzed by the fear of it going wrong that it sort of leads to you missing those decisive moments whenever things could have gone right. I actually just popped in a really weird idea, which is that uh, actually then the Freikorps moving through Germany and everything was probably a pretty successful counterinsurgency uh, operation because it successfully yes. just killed enough people to the point where the population was like depoliticized. Yeah, I think that's that's a great insight right there for sure. I mean, yeah, the amount of like, I you know, we didn't, one of the stats that we didn't touch on, but I think there was one particular moment where the Fry Corps did engage in some sort of like counteraction. I mean, there were like, what did it say? It was something like 20,000 people wounded, 2,000 dead. And the, the disparity of like the communists and socialist groups, their casualties, it was 10 to 1 towards mm -hmm. like the government officials. It's like, yeah, of course you're going to be deeply depoliticized. That's the nature of using mass political violence is to depoliticize a population. Yeah, 100% entirely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it raises so many questions that you have to ask yourself if you want to pretend to be a, or, you know, say that you're a revolutionary. And, and I don't know if any of it necessarily shakes my ultimate convictions, but it certainly makes me wonder. It makes me happy that I'm not in 1920 <laughs> in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell I'm, you what. Well, and I think you do bring up something really important. And this reminds me of what we talked about with uh, Varn on our episodes. It's like, if you're going to talk about being a revolutionary revolution it's like yeah maybe in the end of the day i still call myself that but you ha i think you have to hold that conviction knowing history like this and understanding yeah. the stakes and the risks and like what it would really mean to say that you know i think like me and cc don talk about this like pretty often i think is that you were mentioning like syria right like just understand that like the nature of revolution is catastrophic and its impacts. And I think like at the end of the day, it's like, I would much prefer we don't have to have any situation like that to end capitalism or whatever. But I think it's looking at the history. It's like, well, it's that idea of like, if you ever engage in any sort of like taking of power, you better just automatically assume that the backlash against you, like what happened in Russia, right? Like, like being invaded by 24 foreign powers and then having a mass civil war on your hands. Yeah. You better think really seriously about the implications of, yeah, saying revolution, whatever that means now. And I think that's really the value of this book. And that's why, again, like, I think everybody should try to familiarize themselves with this story. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a great book to read. Um, yeah. Like we were talking about earlier, it's pretty easy to get through. Um, really enough a page turner, but woo wee. <laughs> yeah. Woo wee is right. Comrade, I feel like we're coming to a pretty natural close here. I, I have to tell you, considering the density of this book and the history, I'm fairly blown away with how incredible of a job you just did summarizing all of that like that was pretty astonishing <laughs> to listen to you do that i was i think you've done the red library gang gang and just anyone who's listening to our podcast all over the world i think you've just done them a really really amazing service and uh i i appreciate what the hell you just did because again i think it was pretty <laughs> astonishing to listen to you do that well hey thanks i had a lot of fun never podcasted before but this is pretty crazy yeah yeah, I mean, I would never guess that. I would be like, pro podcaster. <laughs> well, I, I've been listening to podcasts since I was 12. There you go. Uh, there you go. So... You know, I'm going to ask you the, the inevitable question, right? 
Mm-hmm. What would be another book you would want to do? Because I feel like we got to do another book. Well, you know, this is kind of on the same vibe, but I really, and it's like much different, but uh, Fire and Blood, that's a book that like, I think I need to finish that one. And that's mm-hmm. an interesting book to talk about. Perfect suggestion. CC Don has read that. I've had that on my reading list forever. So maybe like all three of us could do that together. I think, oh, I, yeah. I think we got to do it. I think that's a perfect choice. All right, that's a wrap for Red Library this week. I'm very happy to say that this episode is already up there in one of my top faves that we've ever done. It captures that inspiration that we have referenced on our Guatemala episodes in regards to Radio Warner and how much of an influence their work has been on us. So I always love whenever we get to go back to that kind of vibe, that revolutionary history, to cover a little known topic and hopefully do it with a level of depth and nuance while still being accessible. That's the goal. Just to let everyone know, we're coming up on the end of 2020, this nightmare hellscape of a year, and we're going to be taking a little bit of a break probably after the first few weeks in December. There'll still be a patron-only episode at the end of December, but we're going to take a little bit of a breather. We've been doing a lot of hard work on the show, a lot of new projects coming up, a lot of things that we're focusing on. Prior to us taking a short break though, we have a lot of really amazing, excellent content coming your way. And if all goes as planned, we're going to cap the year off with a return to real late night philosophy hours with me and CC Alex on Mari Rudy, which has been a long time coming. So until we see you back here next week, same Red Library time, same Red Library place, stay hydrated, stay motivated, stay liberated, try not to be deracinated, keep searching for those lost futures, keep facing the darkness, try not to blink, and remember, your comrades here at Red Library and all over the world, we out here in solidarity and spirit. We'll see you back here next week. Peace out, y'all.